threats to Florida's sponge habitats come in the form of uh, water quality. Uh, in the past uh, several decades, we've had periodic cyanobacteria blooms, uh, especially in the north and central portions of the bay, where water can get very hot, very salty, uh, prime conditions for a, a bloom. Water quality is a huge issue, whether it's pollutants, you know, from either marine source or land source, or just the heating and the changing the chemistry of the water. We're exposed to hurricanes, as we experienced in late 2017 with Hurricane Irma. Uh, that really did some damage to our sponge communities. And we also have low-grade uh, persistent stressors, like that of physical debris, uh, either from uh, human debris in the water or debris from storms and wind events that move things around uh, that can degrade sponge communities. Uh, sponge restoration uh, is a simple process. We remove uh, part of a sponge that is naturally growing in a healthy habitat. Uh, we use that portion we cut and we cut it up into several fragments, similar to the methods we use for coral fragmentation. Uh, we then uh, strap those to a substrate, block, limestone, uh, set it back down in the bottom, it attaches, uh, and after a while we can eventually outplant it to a degraded site and supplement the natural recovery of those degraded sponge communities. So today we're going to go visit one of our sponge nurseries uh, out in western Florida Bay. Uh, it's got a, a few thousand sponges in it of a, about a half a dozen species or so. These are sponges that uh, occurred in degraded parts of Florida Bay in, prior to these cyanobacteria blooms that have happened over the past several decades. Um, these are sponges that uh, easily fragment uh, and adhere to a brick and we can outplant. Um, and we also find they have uh, important ecological functions as well. Um, we'll see some of the process of you can get in the water, cut up some sponges from the bottom, stay topside, be part of outplanting them into the uh, nursery itself, and see some of the sponges that have been there for a while. My long-term intention is to then regroup them in a disbursement uh, of, of sort of cluster different species, so we're recreating the natural habitat. Uh, in the right environment, sponges can grow and function within a, a year, perhaps even less. 
Uh, other functions may take a little longer when you're looking at broader scale functions, say as habitat for larger adult fishes passing through the area. Well, I can tell you our site's already been successful because they're, they're attached, they're growing, they are starting to look like, you know, full sponges. The very best basic things you measure to indicate the restoration of a site are the growth and survival of sponges, but we also pay attention to the ecological functions uh, associated with sponges. That's their ability to filter water, uh, their uh, function as structure for many organisms, that's spiny lobsters, stone crab, fishes. Uh, and we also measure the restored soundscape. That's the sound uh, produced throughout the uh, marine environment, uh, in this case by in funnel snapping shrimp that live within the sponges and make that snap, crackle, pop uh, sound you hear in a healthy habitat. So I think if that's already been successful, we've also seen the bottom stabilize. There's been, um, within weeks actually, there was algal growth and runners of sea, different seagrass species and um, fish, you know, started showing up fairly, fairly quickly. So it was like went from a desert to the beginnings of a habitat again, a hard bottom habitat. So I was excited about that. We involve volunteers in this work by providing opportunities for members of the community to come out on the boat with us and really be an active part of restoration. To come out, you can get in the water, snorkel, remove sponges from the bottom, you can stay topside and be part of the fragmentation process. Um, it's, it's really a great opportunity for members of the community to work side by side with scientists and be an active part of the restoration process. We still want to do another 1,200 cuttings by the end of the summer, so I think we'll probably involve more people. You can help out with sponge restoration by uh, avoiding anchoring on sponges, just as you would a coral reef, uh, making sure you're not driving too shallow in your vessel, tearing up the bottom. Uh, same, uh, the same measures you would take to protect seagrass and coral reef habitats. One of the biggest things I think people could do to prevent habitat loss is to know the water. I, I'm a proponent of, of licensing for, for operating a vessel because I think a lot of damage could be prevented if people knew how to read the water and had a better idea where they were going. Uh, prop damage is significant even with sponges. Biologists have learned uh, a lot over the past few decades about the importance of these nearshore sponge communities. Uh, and though a lot of the general public uh, tends to overlook it uh, and admire the equally important seagrass, mangrove, coral reef ecosystems, uh, or parts of the ecosystem, sponge communities uh, are a very important part of that ecosystem as well and we're learning more and more about the uh, implications of restoration and conservation of those habitats. It's the whole system needs to be stabilized and I think sponges play a really important part in that.